Would you go to Matthew 21? I want to talk about Palm Sunday. Always liked Palm Sunday, even when I was a Catholic. I couldn't wait to get my palm. They give palms out. And I get my palm. But never really understood the background to it until I became a born-again Christian, like so much. Until God opened my eyes and I began to study the Bible. It is really important to understand Psalm, uh, Palm Sunday uh, and its setting because uh, the same kind of issues are being played out now in the church as they were among the Jews. And you always have to remember that Jesus was a Jew and everything he did was in a Jewish setting and everything he said came from a Jewish context, of especially the Hebrew scriptures. Okay, so uh, Matthew 21, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came unto Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples saying unto them, go into the village over against you and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if anyone say aught unto you, you shall say, the Lord hath need of them and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Zechariah 9 9. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. What was happening was fulfillment of prophecy. That's what's happening today. And they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude opened their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strew them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Okay, what's going on? You got to take into account several things. Uh, number one, in the big picture, you have to remember uh, the place of Jesus and John the Baptist in history. Jesus and John the Baptist came in a very specific time. And that time happened to be 40 years before the worst calamity that the Jews had ever experienced. 40 years. That puts their preaching in a different context. What are they doing? They're calling on people to repent. Why? Judgment's coming. They are end time preachers. Jesus and John the Baptist in a very real sense. It was the last days of Israel. Something so bad happened to Israel they never recovered to this day. They quit being na a nation for 2,000 years. I mean, something shattering was coming. And, the, and they were oblivious because they said, like previous generations of Jews when, they were, when judgment was looming, they said, well, we're children of Abram. We're good. We're good because we're children of Abram. And that's, if you remember, that's the preaching of Jesus and John the Baptist. You think because you're a child of Abram, you're good? Okay. The same thing happened in the days of Jeremiah. Babylonians camping around the city. They're saying, no, we're good. We got the temple of the Lord. Jeremiah says, you think you're all right just because you have the temple of the Lord? See, same thing's happening now in the church. Judgment's coming again. People going, once saved, always saved. I'm good, man, I'm good. Yeah. And they're not, they don't even fear God. They're not, they're not close to God. They don't, they're not with God. But like I say, glad-handed preachers have found a way to get people into churches and make them feel like they're cutting-edge Christians when they don't, they've never been broken. So Jesus and John the Baptist preaching puts on a whole different light. They're in the last days, man. This is almost coming. And that's why they weep over the children. They see what's going to happen when those children are adults. Then you got to remember um, that this is the last week of Jesus' ministry. Everything that he says here is the last week of his earthly ministry. By the way, included in what he says is Matthew 24, the definitive chapter of the end times according to Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 is Jesus on the end times. It's the book of Revelation according to Jesus. And so uh, it's almost, judgment is looming. It's almost coming. And this is the last week. And furthermore, you got to remember that it's Passover week. The, f the ancient feast of Israel, the week of um, the, the, the feast of unleavened bread, Passover, first fruit. 
a pilgrim feast where all of the Jerusalem swells with pilgrims coming to worship the Lord on Passover according to the law of Moses. And then you got to remember um, the, the, uh, the fig tree incident. Okay, look at Matthew 21, verse 18. And we got to learn the lesson of the fig tree. 21, 18. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee from here on forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Okay, in the Middle East, if the fig trees, it's the, it's the, it's the fruit that grows first, then the leaves. That's why it says he saw leaves on it. He said, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat a piece of fruit. But he picked up every single leaf and he found nothing, no fruit. Then he looked at that tree and cursed it. That no one eat fruit of thee from here on. Now, I used to follow very, very t terrible, dangerous heretics who had a totally different version of this. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin say, this will teach you how to have faith. No, this has nothing to do with teaching you how to have faith then what does it mean? That Jesus is the word of God, thus he is the ultimate prophet, and the cursing of the fig tree is a prophetic act with prophetic ramifications. What does it mean? Well, the fig tree in, in prophetic ideology is the symbol for the very blessing of God upon Israel. After all, twice in the Bible it says that the image of the good life, according to God, every man under his vine, every man under his fig tree, right? So by cursing the fig tree, he's saying, the blessing of God is about to be removed from this nation. You got to wake up. Judgment's coming. Now they came by the next day, the fig tree is shriveled up. They're stunned. He says, does that stun you? And then he says something even more devastating. Whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed. Once again, the heretics say, yep, you can go around and say whatever, what, you'll have what you say. No, 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 no. This is a prophetic action. This isn't even just talking about any old mountain. It's talking about the most important mountain on earth called Mount Zion, where the holy house of God was, where God was worshiped on this earth. And he told them the unthinkable. And this is what I've been telling people all over the world. The unthinkable is coming. That mountain, that holy house is going to be plucked up. What does it mean prophetically to be cast into the sea? The sea of the Gentiles. That holy mountain is going to be plucked up and cast into the sea. What? The temple of the Lord is going to be removed. The only place on earth where God is worshipped is going to be wiped out. G Jesus went on to say, not one stone will be left on another. What? <laughs> History says it happened exactly what Jesus predicted. He's predicting the destruction of the temple. I found something interesting recently, and that is that a lunatic asylum with, uh, associated with the UN called UNESCO. Have you ever heard of it? United Nations Educational, Social, and Cultural Organ Scientific and Cultural Organization. Which, whose job it is to assign world heritage sites to different historical places, assigned the Holy Temple Mount as a Muslim shrine. And what Benjamin Netanyahu said, I found very revealing. He said, if you have any doubt about the Jewish connection to this holy mountain, I bid you go to Rome. Boy, when I read that, I thought, what? Rome? Yes, Rome, because in Rome is a very visible monument to the destruction of the temple, the Ark of Titus. And on the side of it, very visible for all the world to see, perfectly preserved, shows Roman legionaries sacking the temple. And what you can see that stands out the most is the holy candelabra and the sacred furniture of the holy place being carted away by the Gentiles. A testament to Jesus' prediction. This mountain is going to be plucked up, cast in the sea, and the Gentiles are going to destroy this place. And the, to, even the disciples could not believe it. Are you kidding? Things are coming that people can't believe. They can't fathom. Then you got to remember also the psalm associated with Passover. So I will, I will have you turn to one other passage of Scripture. Hold your finger, Matthew, but go to Psalm 118. See, just like we have 
certain songs associated with certain types of the year, which I always think of Christmas carols. I love Christmas. I'm not ashamed of it. I love it. <laughs> I love the carols. I mean, can you beat Silent Night for a song? Someone asked me one time, what's your great, the greatest song ever written? Oh, hands down, Silent Night. <laughs> okay. Son of God loves pure light. Radiant beams from his holy throne. Are you kidding me? You got a problem with that? Anyway, the Jews had songs associated with their holidays, and the song associated with uh, Passover is Psalm 113 through 118, which I'll only look at 118. It's called the Hallel. Remember when it says, after Passover meal, the Jew Jesus and disciples sang a hymn and went out? That's what they're singing, Psalm 113 through 118. Now, Psalm 118 is fantastic. And by the way, in your King James Bible, it's the middle of the Bible. Now, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Here's the national carol. Oh, and by the way, I remember when I became a born-again Christian. I was singing Christmas carols, as I always did, every year of my life, around December, November. And I was singing the same carols I knew all my life. But all of a sudden, now that I'm born again, one of them went off on me. You know what I mean by that? It was like, now I get it. Born to save the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. What? <laughs> I've been singing about being born again all these years. <laughs> it just exploded. Because now I really knew what it meant to have Christ in my heart. Well, you, that, what that tells me, though, is you can sing a psalm and not even know what you're singing. This Psalm 118 was sang for centuries, every Passover. It's part of the liturgy, it's part of the season. You march up to Jerusalem, you sing these pilgrim psalms. And Psalm 118, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. See, what the thing about this psalm is, is it's a procession. And this psalm is written in kind of an antiphon, which means, let Israel now say, that's what the leader says, and then Israel says, his mercy endureth forever. And let the house of Aaron now say, that's the ministry, his mercy endureth forever. And let the congregation of those who fear God say, his mercy endureth forever. And what they're doing is they're marching toward Jerusalem, singing this song. And then it says, I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. It's a testimony. I called on God in distress. Distress means you are in, between, we, we say, between a rock and a hard place. There's a New Testament word for that, philipsis, which is translated tribulation. I called upon the Lord in tribulation. See, these psalms are prophecies. This is Israel's testimony. I called upon the Lord in the tribulation. And the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I'll not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord takes my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire on those that hate me. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Israel uh, is putting confidence in world leaders like even America. And I am glad for our president's stance toward Israel. I'm so proud of him. But one day, all of her lovers are going to be removed. And she's going to find out that even the best men cannot save. It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes. All nations compass me about. But in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. You ever think about the UN and the vastness of the nations of the world, and yet the UN spends a third of its time vigorously arguing about a little postage stamp nation set in the Middle East, about Jerusalem and its status and Israel and its boundaries and its so-called crimes, about Judea and the fake nation, Palestine. They compass me about, yea, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them, 11. See, this is their carol. 
You think they knew what they're singing? You think it's, okay, it's Passover time again. All nations compass me about. Well, it had happened before in their history, but not like this song's anticipating. They compass me about like bees. They're quenched as the fire of thorns. From the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Oh, like bees. If you're attacked by bees, you'd think uh, you could stop them with a machine gun. <laughs> Doesn't matter what kind of weaponry you have. A swarm is a swarm. That's how I look at the jihad. But they will be quenched as the fire of thorns. Nothing goes up like thorns. Worthless, cursed thorns. In the name of the Lord. But the Lord, I will destroy them. Verse 13. You have thrust sore at me that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. Oh, you gave your best shot. You almost took me out. Is what her testimony will be. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. You ever heard that verse before? See, a lot of these verses you've heard before. Okay, let me just say something about that verse. The Lord is my strength and my song, and the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my salvation in the Hebrew language is the word Yeshua. Okay. It's the name of Jesus. He says... The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. See, they're moving closer and closer and closer to the temple. The Levites, the priests, the sacrifices, the congregation. And they mentioned the right hand of the Lord, which is another name for the Messiah. The Messiah did valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. And they can sing this century after century after century after century. And it's very possible to sing a song just by mere tradition, just by sentiment. This is a great feeling at Passover. And not even have any idea what you're singing. As they move closer to the temple, then it says, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. One of my favorite verses. Now the Lord hath chastened me sore, indeed he has, but he hasn't given me over to death. Now finally they come to the temple in the psalm. It's all an enactment. Open to me the gates of righteousness. And the gate of the temple is the gate of righteousness, for it is the meeting place between the holy God and sinful man, and by the apparatus of that temple, its sacrificial system, and its priests. Then men can come in, even though they're sinful, and they can have an imputed righteousness and can commune with God. So the leader of the congregation, open the gates of righteousness to me. I'll go into them and I'll praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Once again, another one of the verses of the song. I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and are become my salvation. Now here's the weird verse. Where does this come in? The stone which the builders rejected is actually the most important stone. It's just like me and my Christmas carols before. I don't know what it means, but I love the feeling. I don't know what half of it means, but I love the feeling. This is an odd one. The stone which the builders rejected. What? It's become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Now here's one you're familiar with. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you out of the house of the Lord. See, this 26, this is, remember this song is, comes in parts. This part comes from within the gates. He says, open the gates, and then from within the gates, there's a delegation waiting to meet him, waiting to meet the procession, waiting to receive the sacrifice. That delegation would consist of the high priest, the leaders of the priesthood, and the leaders of the nation. And there's the one, one group says, open the gates of righteousness that we may enter in. And the other says, we bless you out of the house of the Lord. That's how the song goes. And that's what was supposed to happen. Because here's the problem with Palm Sunday. 
and the real meaning of what happened there. That finally, after many, many, many centuries, this was the day. What? You mean it's not a day in general? No, it's a day long anticipated by prophets of God. The day would come when the Messiah would present himself to the people. But Daniel predicted it 530 years later, earlier, to the day. The Messiah, the prince, shall come, and he shall be cut off, but not for himself, but for the people. So this is a procession, and the one group has come to the temple, and they brought the sacrifice, and they brought the, the, the congregation of the God-fearing, and they're all praising God. And then the other group is supposed to say, open the gates to him, let him in, we welcome you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Only that's not how it worked on that day. Because if you remember, on Palm Sunday, Jesus came in, the people were praising him, especially the children. What did they say from within the temple? Make those kids shut up! By what authority do you do these things? No, we bless you out of the house of the Lord. No, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Anyone ever heard that one? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what that really means? Baruch Hababa Hashem Adonai, Hebrew. What that means to come in the name of the Lord means this is the one who bears the prophetic credentials. This is the one who met all the qualifications. This is the one who clicked off every box the prophets said would happen. Born in Bethlehem and coming at the time the death penalty is removed from Israel. I mean, there are like so many qualifications. This is the only possible one it could be. He came in the name of God. Blessed is he who comes in. The, and what blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is, it's a recognition, a public recognition. All right, you're the one. But they didn't. That's why this day was so faithful. Palm Sunday was a turning point for the holy nation. A critical tipping point. Because this was the day the Lord had ordained for the Messiah to present himself to the holy people and for the holy people to receive. Let earth receive her king. <laughs> Only they didn't. No, they didn't. And that's why everything changed from there on. And, you know, if you go back to Matthew again, Matthew uh, 21, he tells a parable. After they don't receive him, he gives them the parable of the vineyard, which I wish I had time to go into. There's about five different variations of the parable of the vineyard. But he's drawing from Isaiah 5. My loved, my loved one planted a vineyard, Isaiah 5. He hedged it about, he prepared it, he, pu he pulled out the rocks, he built up a fence, he drove off the foxes. Man, the preparation he put into that vineyard. But he kept coming for fruit. Translate that to us. You know how much preparation God made in your life to incline you to accept Jesus Christ and to be a sold out Christian? Were you born in Saudi Arabia? No, you were born right here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where there's a church on every corner. And I was raised on arch books. You know what those are? Little Bible books with pictures of Daniel and Moses. And that was my life, my world. I was Catholic. Well, if you're Catholic, you're saying the Apostles' Creed every day. There's enough there to get saved. It's like everything he did it was designed to incline me to bear fruit. And what is fruit? Repentance. True faith in God, not fake. True love for God. So in this parable, it's a parable, there was a certain householder planted a vineyard. He hedged it around about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen. He went to a far country. When the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. <coughs> The husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. 
What? <laughs> yes, they came under deception. They actually forgot it was his vineyard. They thought it was theirs. <laughs> a lot of ministers like that now. Last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let's seize on his inheritance. Hey, we get rid, get rid of him, then we can have, uh, have this all to ourselves. That's what I call the vain imagination. If you can just shove Christ and his voice out of your life, then you can have your life to yourself. Well, that's a lie. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to these husbandmen? And they said, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. They don't realize they're condemning themselves right there. Jesus said, didn't you read in the scripture? Now no, notice which scripture. The stone which the builders rejected. Psalm 118. Everyone around him singing it. It's like here, you go to the store, you can hear Silent Night. Well, I hear more and more secular songs these days. That's a tragedy. But you used to hear strains of Silent Night, oh, come all you faithful, joy to the world, everywhere. The stone which the bill, Jesus said, didn't you read the 118th Psalm? The stone which the builders rejected became the most important stone. So, then we get to Matthew 23, and then I'll close. It didn't work out the way the song portrayed. But it did work out the way the song portrayed. We really saw 118 has two possible uh, endings. One is that when the procession gets to the gate, the priests and the kings and the leaders of the nation say, open the gate to him. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was the good ending. The bad ending. The stone which the builders rejected. That was the most important one. Are you kidding? You just signed your own death warrant. That was the only thing that counted was this one. So in Matthew 23, Jesus gives a blistering sermon to the nation. But he's not just blistering them. He's speaking in his capacity as the Messiah of Israel. In the, in the setting of the holy house of, of God. And this is the last thing that Jesus said to Israel. And everything in that sermon is like as prophetic as anything Isaiah and Jeremiah ever said. It's blistering. He condemned them for their mismanagement of their position. They're leading people into the dark. They're putting burdens on people they won't bear. But then the last thing he says, and it's uh, Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that killed the prophets and stoned those which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? But you wouldn't let that happen. So we see Jesus is not a Calvinist. He says, you wouldn't let it happen. I wanted it to happen. You wouldn't let it happen. And then the next verse he said, this, this one devastating thing and then another. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. In other words... God no longer lives in your house. This house that you might think gives you an out, security. God isn't even here anymore. He's echoing Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, quit going around saying the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord. House of the Lord's only inviolable as long as God's in it. If God ever leaves, anything can happen. And it did, the house was destroyed. Within 40 years of Jesus saying this, the holy house is destroyed. The nation was obliterated. They were cast from one end of the heavens to the other. There's no God in the house. What good is a holy nation without God? What good is a holy house without God? What good is a church if God's not there? I've been asking myself this question. When does a church quit being a church? And what is church but this where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 
Is it when the church ordains homosexuals, goes soft on Islam, praises false religions? When does a church quit being a church? People think we're different than Israel. If he treated Israel that way, he could treat us that way. And then the second thing he said, I tell you, you will not see me from here on. But I'm glad he didn't stop there. He put in an until. Until what? Until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. What? Israel cannot see Jesus until she comes to a point where she goes back and repents of her national sin and says, you know what? Jesus really was the one God sent. He fulfilled all the prophecies. Now, what do you think it's going to take for Israel to ever get to that point? Nothing less than the great tribulation. Great tribulation like the world has never seen before and will never see again. All of the nations are lining up against her. The time of the Gentiles is almost over. I do declare, folks, the rapture is very near. And you got to get right with God, man. You cannot play around. If you're not right with God, then you're going to have to go through a time of judgment. Okay. Jesus is coming back. Now is not the time to flag in your faith. Now is the time to press in, like Chris was saying, and be full of the Holy Spirit and worship the Lord and sell your heart out and find out what the Bible says and, 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 and be edified personally and, and nourish your soul on Christ himself. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for Palm Sunday and the meaning and the message of it. And I thank you for Jesus the great high priest and the savior. And I thank you for this beautiful church that you let me and Chris be part of and that you allow us the privilege of representing in your name and in the name of this church in countries like New Zealand, oh Lord, or South Africa, England, Australia, wherever. Oh God, we, our knees knock because we know it's a great privilege that we can't claim that we live up to but we just claim you and your righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everybody.